Well, today we have the joy of welcoming new members into our church. And I invite those who are taking the vows of membership to come forward at this time. And if I, you know, I, I apologize, I neglected to tell you, if you have someone with you that you would like and comes to come up front and stand with you, they are more than welcome to come. More, you know, one or two or three, what, whoever you'd like to bring along with you. But if those folks will begin to work their way forward, please. Come on up front here and just line up across the front. Yeah, we're a little, we should have moved the altar back a little bit, I guess. <laughs> yeah, try to come on up and line up here in front of the altar. And I'll try not to fall over the cross. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water in the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. Through the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant we declared at our baptism, acknowledge what God is doing for us, and our <clears throat> affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of the world, and repent of your sins? If so, say, I do. I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, please respond, I do. I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Put your whole trust in Him, His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord? in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. If so, say, I do. I do. I do. And according to the grace given you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? If so, please respond, I will. I will. I will. Do you as Christ, do you, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you <laughs> as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? We do. So say we do. The Apostles' Creed will be on the screen. Let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. As members of Christ's Universal Church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? I will. 
as members of this congregation. Will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your witness, and your service? If so, please respond, I will. I will. Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith and confirm their hope and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you. And we, and we welcome, welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ in this congregation of the United Methodist Church. We renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our witness, and our service. We're going to anoint you as a reminder of your baptism. Jim, you have been baptized with God's Holy Spirit. Amen. I pray that the Holy Spirit will lead you Becky, to the place. You have been baptized, baptized with God's Holy Spirit. He's your personal Savior on your own as a young man. You have been baptized with God's Holy Spirit. May the Holy Spirit. You have been baptized be with God's Holy Spirit, and Joyce. Loopy, you. you have been baptized you with God's Holy Spirit. I believe in God and Jesus. Andrew, you too have been baptized with God's Holy Spirit. May the Holy Spirit continue to be with you. David, you, care for this you have been baptized family. with God's and Holy Spirit. May the Holy Spirit fill you full of love and joy and the willingness to work for God's kingdom. May the Holy Spirit fill you with grace and mercy in all that you do, people around you, and your family. The God of all grace, who called us to eternal glory in Christ Jesus, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you might live in grace and peace. Let us welcome these new members of our church. You may be seated. How is everybody today? So I know a couple of you are in spring break last week. Did you enjoy your spring break? Yeah. Awesome. So do you guys know what t special day today is? Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, that's right. So, and Palm Sunday is a very special day. So are there any famous people or anybody that if they were coming to town, you'd be excited to go watch them and stand in line for them? You shook your head, Logan, who is it? I don't really. You don't really? What about Patrick Mahomes? <laughs> I know you like the Chiefs. Yeah. And, you know, my daughter, she's trying to convince me to drive her six hours to see her favorite singer, Alec Benjamin. So, you know, I don't even know who that is, but she's excited about it. <laughs> so that's the type of thing that Palm Sunday was. So Jesus came into town and everybody was so excited. They came out and they watched him except it was on a much greater level. Because with Patrick Mahomes or with a singer, you know, if you're a fan of that person, you may wanna be there. But if you don't know who that is or don't know what music they sing, you may not be very interested in being there. But for Palm Sunday, everybody was excited about Jesus coming to town because he was their king, savior. He was coming to save them, right? And along those same lines, you know, he needed a donkey to ride into town on. So, you know, he went and he asked, or one of his disciples went and asked to borrow a donkey so he could ride into town. So do you think if one of those people that we mentioned is coming to town that somebody's just gonna willingly give their donkey or their horse up for them to ride into town on? You're right, I don't think so. If they do, they'd probably see it as a great money-making tool and they would want to rent it out or sell the horse, right? So when Jesus was riding the donkey down the, the path into town, 
It was kind of like if you've ever watched the op the Olympics opening ceremony when the athletes all come into town or into the arena, they're waving all the flags and cheering for them. Except back then they didn't have flags, right? So what do you think they waved instead? Logan? Palm leaves. Palm leaves. So that just like you did when during our song when we came in, everybody came in waving the palms and they laid them down on the cross. So that's where it gets the name Palm Sunday from, is because everybody had the palms and they were waving them in celebration. And they were all excited. And so that's why we celebrate Palm Sunday. So obviously it was a joyous day, but it didn't last. If you guys wanna know more about what happened after that, come back on Thursday night and see me and a few others in the play, okay? <laughs> all right, you wanna pray with me? All right. Dear God, Dear God, thank you, thank you for coming on this joyous day, for coming on this joyous day to, save us, to save us and allow us to follow you. And allow us to follow you. Please be with us, please be with us as we go through the week. As we go through the week. And be with us when we come back. And be with us as we come back. To hear the rest of the story. To hear the rest of the story. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our Bible reading this morning comes to us from the 23rd chapter of Luke, verses 32 through 43. You may read along with me on the screens in front of you, or you may follow along in the Pew Bibles on page 89. Two others, who were criminals, led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the Skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing and they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever known one? Or were you one? Or you still think you're one? You went to school with them maybe. Maybe you grew up with them. Maybe you live with them. Maybe you even think you're better than them. They are easily identified by the labels that we put on them, such as losers, nerds, geeks, or failures. They get mocked and they get bullied and, and they're ridiculed and they're made fun of. They're ostracized and they're isolated. They're on the outside looking in and nobody ever offers to have them in. 
you might say they're on the fringes. One of the most amazing things about this man named Jesus is the fact that he gravitated toward people who we run away from. The people that re repel us. The people that we repel, he was drawn to like like a magnet. The people we overlook are the people that he looked for. The people we overlook, he looks over them. He welcomes them. The people we wouldn't give the time of day to him gave almost every day, every moment of his life for. We've all just completed our, our study on Luke, a series that may have touched your heart more than any other series or Bible study you've been a part of. It has hopefully touched a raw nerve in you. It may have brought back bad memories. It might have even triggered some painful recollections. Yet the way that Jesus dealt with the outcasts of society will both encourage us who have been there, enable us perhaps to look at other people in a completely different way. It's very fitting this Palm Sunday that we look at an encounter that Jesus had with one of the people that was on the fringes. It's fascinating to me that the last earthly encounter that Jesus ever would have was not with the president of a, a powerful country or the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. It wasn't with the king of an empire. There are very few of us in this room listening to this message or watching it on television that are not haunted by the ghost of failure. Many of us carry regrets, the guilt, the heartache of an area in our life which we just simply failed. When I was in high school, one of my greatest dreams and desires was to be a cheerleader for the basketball team. I had dreams of getting a, a letter jacket and cheering in front of my mom and dad and, and with all my friends who were also cheerleaders already. I worked all one summer getting ready for tryouts with my friends in my church because they were cheerleaders in another county and they were working with me to become a good cheerleader. I practiced jumping high, shouting cheers I already knew. You know, the hands on the hips, arms in the air, Splits. <laughs> which were not my greatest skill. But I was ready when the tryouts came. The cheer coach happened to be my social studies teacher and we kind of had a good relationship and every day after tryouts she would tell me that I was in great shape to make the team. I wasn't the best out there, but I clearly wasn't the worst, and it was obvious, at least to me, I could easily be in the top ten. And the top ten was the team. And I felt sure I'd make that team. So it was the last night of tryouts, and the cheerleader, or the cheer coach, grinned at me at the end and gave me a thumbs up, and I was in heaven. 
I didn't sleep much that night, and I could hardly wait till the next morning when I got to the school and, and found that list to check my name. And when I got there, my world exploded. I couldn't believe my eyes. I didn't make it. I ran into my empty locker room and I began to cry and, and it was a tough day. My social studies class met at the end of the day and when I went into that classroom it was really rough and, and my teacher didn't even look at me that day. After class I waited around and before I could say anything she said, I was overruled. The other judge said, not you. I didn't make it. <coughs> the hardest thing I had to do was to tell my mom and dad and to tell my friends from church that all their hard work went down the tubes because of the splits. You've been there. You wanted to finish college, but you, you quit. And you feel like a failure because of that. You intended, some of you, to be married till death do us part, but things happened and, and then there was a divorce. And you feel like a failure. Maybe you invested mo bit money in a, a big company and convinced that you'd strike it rich, but then you lost everything you had and you were feeling like a failure. If you've ever failed at anything and you feel like you're a failure in any way, this Palm Sunday message is made for you and for me. We're going to learn today about a man who was the ultimate failure, but when he encountered Jesus, he gave us the greatest principles that we could ever remember in dealing with failure. The key takeaway, you can have failure in your life, without being a failure with your life. You can have failure in your life, but not being a failure with your whole life. It's interesting that Jesus is being crucified between two criminals. Normally the centurion in charge would have chosen to put two criminals to, with each other and, and Jesus off to the side, but the Roman soldier didn't realize, he didn't realize that even at that point he was fulfilling an ancient prophecy in Isaiah that says, be numbered with the transgressors. This was the only crucifixion in history that was ever prophesied. What makes it even more unusual is that the three men are being crucified for crime, but there's one big difference. Two were dying for crimes they did commit, and one was dying for sins he did not commit. Therein lies the word that all of us who have ever failed need to hear. No matter how badly you failed in the past, and no matter how great a failure you may think you are today, Jesus will take us under any condition. You would think that Jesus would at least be crucified with people who were guilty of what they might call today white-collar crime. Not so. Luke tells us that they were criminals. A better word would be evildoers. These men had a rap sheet a mile long. 
they were most likely paid assassins with question guilty of multiple, they were probably, had done many murders. Today, we, we might find them as a part of a common street gang or Antifa who just kill for the fun of it. In other words, there wasn't one redeeming quality about these thieves on the crosses. They were so inconsequential and so on the fringe that we don't even know their names. They had failed at doing anything right and had succeeded in doing everything wrong. It looks like they've lived a wasted life and they're going to die a wasted life. But then something changes. You wouldn't know this from reading Luke's account, but Matthew tells us that at first, both criminals mocked Jesus. We heard that in the scriptures today. They both mocked Jesus. Both men reviled Jesus. The first criminal didn't even, ins he, just, he didn't just insult him, he used words that Luke says would be used for blasphemy. Unthinkable things he said. But then the second thief miraculously has a change of heart. A light comes on and and he's seeing things different. He opens his eyes. He's finally getting it. He's getting what he deserved while Jesus is not. To me, it may be the greatest single story of conversion in the entire Bible because the same mouth that was cursing Jesus just moments before is now defending Jesus. What could possibly have happened? He didn't see Jesus perform a miracle. He didn't see him when he blessed the bread and fed 5,000 people. He didn't even hear a sermon about Jesus. <laughs> but according to Luke, all he heard was one thing that Jesus said and Jesus said this, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they do. When he saw a man respond to people who were crucifying him, condemning him, and cursing him, the truth flashed before his eyes like lightning. And he said, I deserve to die but Jesus deserves to live. I'm a sinner. Jesus is a savior. Forgiveness is exactly what I need. I wonder if what he offered me, what he offered them, he would offer me. probably with not a lot of confidence, with fear and trembling, probably not even being able to look Jesus in the eye, this man on the cross makes a simple request. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He didn't say, Lord, I want to be honored when you come into your kingdom, or I want to be blessed when you come into your kingdom, or I want to be rewarded when I come into your kingdom. He just said, I want to be remembered. Lord, will you remember me when everyone else has forgotten me? Look at me. I'm an ultimate failure. Here on my deathbed, I have no friends and family. My enemies didn't even show up. 
I failed at life, and now I'm even failing in death. Jesus, will you remember me? Will you give me what I need the most and what I deserve the least? Would you give me forgiveness? and a place in your kingdom? If you know the story, you already know the answer. The man needed what Jesus had to offer, but he couldn't offer anything that Jesus either needed or wanted. He had no leverage, no bargaining chips, and couldn't make a deal. What's he going to say? Jesus, will you remember me when I come into your kingdom? I promise I'll go to church. I'll try to be a better husband and a better dad. If you remember me, I won't cheat on my income taxes anymore. And I'll even start tithing. No. He realized he needed what Jesus had to offer, but he had nothing to offer Jesus. I wonder what you're thinking. Are you feeling like you're a failure? That you are the one that's blown it and you feel like there's no way that God could ever accept you and, and what you are about to witness reminds us that there's more grace in God's heart for the sins of our past. Jesus will take us at any condition. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. At the last moment, probably with his last breath, because we're not told that he ever said another word, he makes one more appeal to Christ, justice of the Supreme Court of the universe. And I submit to you my opinion, he is the most amazing example of faith in the entire Bible. In an instant, just before this man slips off his clothes on the earth and puts on clothes for eternity, Jesus answers this man's request and makes a reservation for him in heaven. All the man said was, remember me, because all he had to offer was himself. He couldn't say, remember my good works, because relatively speaking, he didn't have any. He couldn't say, remember my church attendance, because he never went. He couldn't say, remember my offerings, because he never gave. All he could say was, remember me. And remember what Jesus said to him. Truly, I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. Wow. What a day it turned out to be for this criminal. What he thought was going to be the worst day of his life turned out to be the best day of his life. In the morning, he's in prison. At noon, he's hanging on a cross, and at dinner time. He's sitting in the VIP section of the kingdom of God right next to Jesus. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever wondered why these two crosses next to Jesus, why they were there, why there weren't six or seven or ten? Have you ever wondered why Jesus is in the center? Why wasn't he in the far right or the left? I believe it was God's way of illustrating to all of us in this room that just like those two criminals, you have a choice. Those two men had so much in common. They committed crimes, the same crimes, and they were convicted by the same court. 
they had so much in common. They each had the same opportunity to make the same choice. You will have failure in your life, but you can choose not to be a failure with your life. This criminal had made a lot of bad choices. He was enjoying the fruit of the one good choice he had made. In the end, if you make the best choice, which is trusting Jesus, he can wipe away all the bad choices you've made. If you're sitting here today saying, I wish I could make up for all the failures that I've experienced, you can. One good decision for Jesus can cancel out every bad thing you've ever done, every bad choice you've ever made. What's it going to be? Before death, these two criminals were separated by about 12 feet. And after death, they are separated by eternity. What simply separated them was one rejected Jesus and one received Jesus. We're all going to die someday. I guess it's a question you have to answer. Are you going to die with your hands clenched and like the thieves and shake them in the face of God? Or are you going to open your hands to the heart of God? It's what he said next that is mind-boggling. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. No man ever looked like a king than Jesus did at that moment. Beaten to a pulp, you couldn't even recognize him. His throne was a cross, and the only crown that he had was one made of thorns. This thief had never met Jesus until this day. He never heard Jesus tell his parables, but he suddenly realized he was the king of kings. Remember this, this man was never baptized, never ate from the Lord's Supper, never went to confession, never joined a church, never went to church and never gave one penny to the Lord's work, but robbed a lot of money from the Lord's workers. The only thing he had left was accept what Jesus was doing for him. And what did Jesus say? Truly I say to you, today you'll be in paradise. If you had been there that day and somebody said to you, what chances do you think that criminal has of going to heaven? You would have probably said, he doesn't have a prayer. But in fact, a prayer was all he had. And prayer is all he needed. There's one thing we learn in this moment. Anybody can call on Jesus at any time, and he will always answer. You're not going to get a busy signal, and you won't have to be put on hold. Jesus, remember me. And Jesus will say, I will. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for this Palm Sunday morning. When we deal with the joy of following children and, and Christ into the city, waving palm branches, what a joy. But boy, how things turn quickly. And the next day we're hiding because they're looking for those Jesus people.
to be with us this day as we share the bread and the cup, that this will be our reminder of we'll have a day in paradise with you. Thank you, God, for loving us and for saying you will. Amen. You see the significance of the cross today? We had a prayed, saying hosannas, and crosses, palms were left on the cross. Ash Wednesday, people were invited to come and nail their failures or whatever to the cross. And if you haven't done that, there's still plenty of room on this cross after service. If you want to come up here quietly and do that, there's still time. Yay, raw Jesus. <laughs> for saying unto this day, I will remember you and you will be in my kingdom. Sing with me. Jesus, remember me when you come.